Hi, it's Mark Edder from Moose Marketing NPR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefers, where each week I invite a panel of business experts to talk about the local and national newspapers, talk about what's happening in their own individual business and their own individual business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's, in this week's Punchline. So before I start, I'd just like to thank our fantastic sponsors, Hazel Woods, who are uh, accountants and business advisors. Just hold the mug up as well. And uh, they make great coffee too. Right, okay, let me introduce you to the fantastic panel we've got this week. So we've got Jeff Birch. He's a business guru, author, TV presenter, internationally renowned, it says here, is a highly motivational business speaker. He's the author of five books, including the bestseller, Resistance is Useless, and the BBC TV's top series, Go it alone. We've got Charlie Sharples, ex-England and Gloucester winger, rugby player, legend in the shed. And before he had to, he just retired due to his shoulder injury. He scored 91 times and 454, 55 points. He's now become, he's now become a mere mortal like the rest of us. And he's cutting his teeth as a, as a, as a financial advisor at Gemini Financial Planning. Welcome to Charlie to the show. We got Paul Soden, owner of Cafe Rene uh, Group, Cafe Rene, the Fountain of the Imperial, the coach and horse of the Tiger's Eyes. He's got 51 staff, 3 million turnover. He always looked knackered. I'm not surprised because he just rolled in. It's from half past two in the morning. Thanks for Paul for joining us. And funny, not, not least, we got Sam Holiday, uh, Federation of Small Business Development Manager uh, for Gloucestershire, Bristol, Bath, the South of Gloucestershire. He's a good friend of mine, and he's ex, he's also the ex-editor of the Bath Chronicle newspaper. So, okay, let's just quickly catch what's catching, uh, what's on the uh, hitting the nationals, courtesy of the BBC. Let's just go through the papers very, very quickly. So, the Metro Brit killed in Ukraine. This is the sad story of Mr. Scott Sibley, who has a very brave um, soldier who's obviously gone over to fight in Ukraine. Financial Times, Biden asked Congress for $350 billion in aid to support Ukraine. The Guardian, Biden defies Putin's threats by doubling aid for Ukraine. The Daily Telegraph, Britain to send 8,000 troops to Eastern Europe. The I, new sexual harassment claims hit Parliament. The Daily Star, shame of Britain disorder. Toxic boobs problem bling, oh. I won't even go there. Disorder, disorder. <laughs> Thank you. I, didn't want to, I was practicing that earlier. The Daily Mail, Labour's lockdown lies and hypocrisy, says the paper. The Times, stop taking painkillers for arthritis patients told. And also, is it the end of the BBC licensing? Uh, and the uh, Daily Express, death of the BBC license fee. The Daily Mirror, a step nearer justice for my, for my James. This is uh, James Baldwin. Would you believe it's 30 years ago that that terrible crime was committed? Anyway, let's go over to my fr good friend, Sam Holliday. Sam, thanks for joining us today. What have you picked out in the papers, please, sir? Yeah, a pleasure, Mark. It's nice to see that picture of the Queen, wasn't it? And she looked well, fantastic. Um, yeah, and I mean, obviously, we could talk endlessly about the war and, and, and the papers are dominating it, but it, it feels sometimes as if we, there's, there's not a lot we can do here to, to influence that. So I've, I've looked at a couple of other things, actually. And, and one thing really quite took my eye was in the Times today um, uh, about house prices. And this is relevant to me because um, our house is on the market at the moment, not having much interest, but that's fine because it's early days. But the bit that got me was that Gloucester, which was once the poor relation in some, in some people's eyes, is now the fifth highest rise in house prices in the country. Um, and I think that is quite a surprise, really, when you think about it, because I think we've always known in Gloucestershire that house prices in places like Cheltenham and Stroud and the Cotswolds are always on the rise, but now Gloucester's rising as well. And I think in some ways that can be seen as a bit of a vote of confidence in the city, that, you know, people have seen that something's happening here and they, and they actually want to sort of come here. But it is interesting also to note, especially with Bath playing Gloucester um, tomorrow at rugby, that's probably the only chart where Bath are above Gloucester this season, so that's worth noting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the other story that caught my eye um, was, I don't know if you've you ever heard, it's, it's been a lot on the radio as well this morning, that Amazon's profits are down. Um, now, there was a, a lot of businesses that really did quite well during, throughout the pandemic for fairly obvious reasons, I think, and Amazon and Netflix amongst them. Both of them have taken big hits recently. Uh, and Amazon, because um, 
if you're a small business and, and so many small businesses are struggling at the moment with all the costs, supply chains and all kinds of stuff like that, Amazon are having exactly the same problems. They're having supply chain problems. They're transport problems. You think how much it costs now for diesel, how much it costs for petrol. If we, if we want our, our products to arrive the day after, then sometimes with a very little value, then that is a lot of miles that have been used up to deliver all these products. So for the first time in a number of years, Amazon are, are struggling as well. And I think you can start to see that if, if Amazon is struggling, if Netflix is struggling, then you imagine what it's like for the whole business community at the moment. I mean, Mark, you, you and I share the same pair of rose tinted glasses about the economy. We're always trying to big up what's happening, but it's tough out there. And I think that while there may be a certain amount of schadenfreude from small business thinking, ah, Amazon is struggling a bit now like the rest of us, it isn't really, because it's symptomatic of the fact that it, it's difficult out there. So your house prices may be rising, but sadly, everything else is. No, oh, that's fantastic. Good, good lead in there, uh, Sam, and a good overview. I'm sure we'll talk about the small business community coming back to you later on. Let's go to you, Paul. Paul, what have you picked out from the uh, media today? Well, I, I think we're, we're all agreed that we could, you know, talk for hours about the Ukrainian situation. I'd just like to, you know, briefly point out, to get on to my main point, that, you know, I do see something sinister, um, and a lot of my friends seem to say I'm a bit obsessed about it, about the Chinese backing for what the Russians are doing. And I, th I think it's highly significant that we should look at this. And the way China's manipulating the world at the moment and taking over the Solomon Islands and putting in military. And there's a lot going on here that more worries me than just Ukraine, but we could talk about that for hours. But I'm also porn gate, party gate and all of that. I mean, we could, we could forever. But I was also quite interested in it just from a personal level in the story about people taking painkillers. And, and it's not just about arthritis. For, years I took so many different painkillers for sciatica and I saw a wonderful um, TV doctor, I think his name is Michael Mosley, he, he did one on sleep and um, one on some exercise and, and one on pain and he tricked people with placebos with, they all agreed to go on the trial with basically instead of them taking what they thought was the strongest painkiller every day for whatever pain they had, he'd actually tricked them and they weren't taking that painkiller. Um, he proved at the end of it that what happens is that after a long period of time, which indeed happened to me, the painkillers simply don't work. I mean, unless you want to go down the, the opiate routes, but, but they just don't work. So I packed them all up. And the exercise part that goes with that, it's weird that he actually showed this Michael Mosley doctor, somebody who was almost unable to work a lady, go in a, a ring and take on an ex-Kung Fu uh, fighter, not, not as a real fight, but just to show that she could get this mobility going back uh, and I think these stories are vital and it goes along with alternative health services, people being looked at in a different way from the way we're looking at medicine at the moment with the NHS. So I, I loved that article. I think in a way it's a positive article after the rest of the newspaper headlines. No, no fantastic. I'm a big fan of Michael Mosley as, as well. And, um, uh, and, it, and is, is, is the way that he views health and healthy eating. Yeah. And as someone who, like myself, who's had a heart attack, I have actually fundamentally change my diet i don't eat soft cheese i don't eat a lot of salt and you know and all that sort of stuff I eat a lot more vegetables and fruit my my big problem is i just drink too much wine that's why my my head is still like a bowling ball but anyway talk about health and fitness that's a very nice lead on to charlie i mean charlie obviously you played all those games obviously looked after yourself all those years it's going to be interesting to watch your development now you're in with the you know with the rest of us in the business community hopefully you'll you'll you'll, you'll you, you well i was going to say hopefully i don't mean it like that at all but you probably end up like the rest of us uh, anyway what have you picked out for the papers please sir yeah, so thank you for that introduction. Health will remain a, an important part of my of my life, don't worry. But yeah, obviously, as you alluded to, pre, a few a few of you guys, there's lots of distressing and unfortunate situations unfolding around the world. So I sort of flicked back to what I know, which is sport, where there's always something to celebrate and something to be happy about, depending on who you support. And I thought it was very fitting this week with the news that uh, Tyson Fury has announced his retirement and. Uh, Personally, I'm not a, a massive boxing fan, but he's definitely somebody that, um, you know, a character that we're all drawn to and a huge, huge character with it, within that sport. He's had a phenomenal career. Um, and it, I was a bit sad, actually, because I, I think I, along with a lot of people, was probably hoping that there was going to be a big fight between him and Joshua or him and... Um, oh, who's the guy that just beat Joshua? See, I don't know anything about boxing. Someone help me out there. Who's the Ukrainian guy? His, his name's just left me. Klinsk, um, 
Oh, oh no, yeah, was, I'm with you. Oh, yeah. it's really... <laughs> anyway, um, but yeah, I, I, and then I thought about it this morning. I thought, oh, maybe it's a bit of smoke and mirrors, and he's just selling his. He's just given the placebo retirement to sell a big comeback fight. But yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think a, a sportsman who's had a fair bit of criticism and who's had his ups and downs, but somebody who we should definitely celebrate as a British sportsman who's had a phenomenal career. And, you know, you know, like everybody else, really, that this must be really difficult to finally say, right, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I think he, he sort of alluded to it in his point, but he doesn't really have anything. He's kind of won just about everything you can win in the sport and doesn't really have anything left to prove. So I suppose it's externally, it's just that people want to see that one more fight, you know, the big unification fights. But um, I, I'm not 100% sure that he's going to retire for good. But uh yeah, just something I thought would be worth paying a mention to. No, 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 good point. And uh, the thing about it, do you notice the way how none of the guys there threw the ball to you then? Nobody helped you out there as you were struggling with the... <laughs> Obviously no boxing <laughs> fans in the, on this panel. I mean, hey. I, like I said, I'm not a massive boxing fan per se, but I watch, you know, the, the big fights. But, um, it, yeah, I, I, I can't... I've, that, the name is just like on the tip of my tongue. Everyone watching this will be screaming it at the screen, but... I pay to watch that fight. It's even worse, Charlie. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> it's not even coming back to me no now. Excuse. It just goes to show what team players you all are. Anyway, <laughs> let, let's let's go over to to. Thanks ever so much for that, mate. Let's go to Jeff. Jeff, what have you picked up from the papers, mate? Well, um, the, the first one is that is this thing at this um this thing that says Sunak rebuilds his reputation. It says there. Because because he really screwed up with all this thing with his missus and everything else. However, I'm an enormous fan of Private Eye magazine, who in this week's copy, just to conflict that, is say uh, is got this expose of how Sunak's been doing all sorts of dodgy things with loans, six hundred and fifty thousand quid went walkabout from his wife's company to him, and this, that, and the other. And it, it's just actually in general the conflict between subversive magazines like Punchline and Private Eye that expose stuff that the general public don't see in, in the media. Um, and, I, and I think that's a, that's a big thing. By the way, my, my, my thing, my, my big thing is this cartoon in Private Eye, which is that thing about Angela Rayner and her legs. And the caption is, she's, she's the one looking at a twat all day, which... <laughs> <laughs> which I think is absolutely wonderful. And also... <laughs> I think Mark just had another heart attack. The other one, which is very poignant, is this one, which is, which is actually Paddington Bear with the little label that says, please look after this bear, and he's being taken to Rwanda. <laughs> 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 which kind of sums up, <laughs> sums up everything. I think another uh, to, to reflect on Paul as well, uh, uh, and uh, and Sam is that the the insolvencies is higher than it's ever been ever before in small businesses, um, and one of the re well, there's two reasons. One is that the business environment out there is a bit crap, uh, but the other one is that that rich our hero Richie Sunak, who everybody thought was wonderful, piled this money in uh, but he didn't do it very thoughtfully so he piled money into companies that were dead they were going to go bust anyway so they all got these business loans and then he just shut it off so now there's this massive tidal wave of companies some are going bust because the poor devils have had a hard time and others are going bust because they've gone bust anyway um and now the insolvency sort of business is going through the roof because you know they're these companies were propped up with these, these loans and VAT holidays, and now whammo, it all just stopped. You know, it, 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 it's like switching off life support, you know. Everybody got put on it, and then it, they just went and pulled the plug out. The wall said, no more electric for you, kid, and that's it. No, no to, totally agree. Well, we'll come back over to Sam. Thank, thanks for that. I'd just like to say that obviously Rishi Sunak is not here to defend himself. Well, I'm, I'm, so, not, I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not casting any nasturtiums before they sue us. Um, but I'm just saying that I, I always know, I read Private Eye all the time, partly for the humour, but partly because they keep exposing 
the most tremendous on all political parties, doesn't matter who they are, they've got this thing called rotten boroughs. And two or three times the Cotswold district councils found themselves in there. And either they're slandering people or they're doing stories that no other publication would dare to do. It's funny you should say that. No, we, we've actually had a couple of stories that have appeared in Private Eye, actually, as a, as a lead on. So uh, uh, from, from um, oh, we're not going to go there. I'm not going to go back over that sort of stuff. But you are right. They do seem to cover a lot of other stuff that isn't covered anymore. And let's be honest, our local newspapers, there just isn't that investigative journalism there anymore. It's all right. bait, shit bait. So, so we can get up to stuff. We can all get up. To... <laughs> we can all get up to stuff. We're, we're talking about clickbait and shitbait. That's a nice lead on to Sam. <laughs> Obviously, I only say that, Sam, because you know when you and I were in the media and you worked at the Bath Chronicle, as I did as well, not at the same time. Uh, but not people we might have mentioned this before. Sam used to be the editor of the Bath Chronicle. I used to be the advertising manager at different times. And Sam, it's a completely different world, isn't it, from when we were at papers. It, it really is, and, and in lack of investments, and um, terrible, really. I mean, um, <clears throat> looking at Charlie and thinking about um, sport, I think I had about nine people on my sports desk. Um, I mean, now you probably don't have nine people in the entire editorial room. And we had a dedicated um, Bath rugby writer and, and so forth, and um, it, was, it, was, it was a fantastic time to be in newspapers, really. It, incidentally, Charlie, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a round ball person, yet I've now spent the last 17 years in the two biggest rugby towns in Britain as far as I'm concerned, Gloucester and Bath. And when I first went to um, Bath um, from the Midlands, you can probably tell by my accent, they gave me a, a Bath rugby top because I said, you're going to be a Bath rugby supporter. So when I moved to Gloucester 10 years ago and, and I joined a local gym, I just grabbed my Bath rugby top, put it on, went to the gym. Bad mistake. Never worn it again. <laughs> I was on the rower and it was on number seven on the side and I was going along and these four very big burly goats come looked at my shirt and pushed it up to 10. I was doing this, and I was thinking like that. So never again. <laughs> but I'm going tomorrow. I'm going to Bath Rugby against Gloucester. And who tomorrow. are you supporting? That's more important. Oh, that's tricky. I think I've got to say Gloucester, really. But um, Correct Bath answer. It's my first rugby <laughs> team. But, uh, my wife's a Gloucester fan, so I've got no choice. Um, yeah, um, actually, coming back to sport, I mean, um, Charlie raised a very interesting point there about, about um, Tyson Fury, because exit planning for businesses is difficult, but it's difficult for individuals as well. And fully enough, when I left the Bath Chronicle, someone said to me, and I, and I did it on my own volition, and just decided it's time to go. They say you should leave when people are asking why, as opposed to when. So, you know, and, and one of the saddest things, and boxing is probably the best example of this, but Charlie might have seen his own sport, is people who go on longer than they should. And, and, they, and they're less and less powerful in their role, they're less and less good at what they do. So whether you're a business or an individual, when you leave something is as important as when you start it. And, and, and it's a tough decision, but I'm not 100% sure Tyson Fury has gone, but well, that's another point. But um, Alexander yeah. Usk, that was the guy, that was it. That was the name, Usk. Got it. Well done. <laughs> um, but yeah, sorry, Mark. Um, coming back to what um, 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 we were saying earlier about, about the, the, the state of business, yeah, it, it is tough. And I think Amazon reflects it really. And, and the, we're feeling if Amazon is struggling, then we're all struggling, but it is always, it's inflation. It's, it's costs, it's supply chains, it's so many different factors. And, and I know Paul employs a lot of people in Gloucester, and that is, must be getting harder and harder to get staff now. We're hearing from business owners are saying that when, once upon a time, an interview was the person in front of you trying to impress you. Now it's the other way around because the job, job seekers have got so much choice, they'll come in with various demands and you've got to sell yourself to them. And it still always have been that to a certain extent, but now the, the balance has really shifted around. So if you imagine if you are a small business, trying to compete with the big guys in that situation, very difficult. Yeah, but Sam, I think that's going to change, mate. I think that's going to yeah, change. Think, as, 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 as we alluded to and what Jeff said, uh, you know, lots of companies now are really, really struggling. As we're moving into this next quarter, you know, the money that was there from after Christmas, the, the disposable income that was there, the savings that was there, they're, it's all going to be eaten away. And there's already seemed to be a contraction. There's already seemed to be people hanging on to their cash. You're not going to go to the restaurant so much. You're not going to go to delivery so much. You, you just can't afford it as the prices go up and up and up. And so I think it's going to be an alignment. And uh, we were at a commercial property forum the other day, and they were talking about how retail struggling, hospitality is struggling. Yeah. Uh, the only people seem to be making money is those uh, is logistics sort of side of stuff, uh, or the pharmaceutical, or if you're in, I hate to say it, avionics or the military hardware. They're going to they're going to be people making money. Anyway, that, thanks ever so much. And that leads us back over to Paul. Paul, what's it like, mate? You're running all these pubs. 
You've got 50 odd staff. Well, you know, I must admit, as, as a lockdown skeptic, I, I didn't see things bouncing back as well as they have so far, apart from uh, what they did to us at Christmas and killed the golden goose that gets us through January, February, March. We're still here and I'm amazed by the loyalty of customers and, and staff. And, and actually, I'm just amazed. And um, I think Bruce summed it up. They've just turned the tap off first of April. Inflation's going mad. We've had the minimum wage go up. We've had prices go up. VAT's gone back up to the full 20%. When I was hoping the government would leave it down around the European level of 10% in hospitality. You know, I, I'm failing to understand any of that. And I was gutted that they, they did that with the VAT on food. So, yeah, all at once, the tap's been turned off, as Bruce rightly pointed out, and as Sam's pointed out. It is tough out there. Trying to find staff it is, is difficult. We finally got our kitchen, at Cafe Rennie particularly, back up to full strength. And we're now open all day, every day for food, which we were for, for 18 years. And it's only literally this week we've started doing it again. So it has been tough. I see it being even tougher. These wages uh, rises, the, the, particularly the beer price rises, we've seen at about 7.1%. And on it goes. So, And the loans that we took out and the end of this support and that and the other. So I think this next year or, or so is going to be, be tough. But um, in a way, I'm quite looking forward to it. I feel a great positivism that if they don't, I keep saying they because I'm a lockdown sceptic, if they don't interfere with what we, we do, um, I think the future is quite bright. And yet I see the terrible side of the economy, what it's causing to people individually, the fuel and everything else. And I think a lot of it's been mismanaged, but I, I constantly find myself criticising government. And recently, as I get older and older, more and more so do I seem to just criticise government, lack of forethought, planning, knowing that this gas price electric would come. I think, you know, there's obsessions and the party gate one has been one of them that just don't allow these people to concentrate to one of the fundamental things of what they're supposed to do is help govern and run a country and an economy. And to me, they failed. I'm, I'm disgusted with them all. And it doesn't matter what paper I read or what television station I put on. It's, it's how I feel. We all work and try our best. And to me, I, I don't look up to any of them at all. I'm very sorry about that, but I don't. But I'm not surprised that you're, you know, you guys are doing well because you run a great business, mate. You've got a great reputation. You're there always. Whenever I've popped in, you're always there, the, 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 you know, steering the ship. And um, and that's what's going to take. That's what's going to make the difference, isn't it? It's all about service. It's all about quality. It's all about keeping that consistency uh, for all of us. You know, I, I'm lucky enough. I talk to lots of businesses. Thanks for that, Paul. Thanks for that honest appraisal of what you think there. Okay, Charlie, let's come over to you, mate. So um, congratulations, you've left the wonderful world of rugby. Uh, how's it going? How's it going at Gemini? Yeah, no, it's all going well. Um, just, you know, finding my feet with the, the transition, getting used to different schedules, being in an office. But I think, as I alluded to in my previous conversation with you that we had, that it was kind of a, a gradual transition. So it wasn't a complete shock when I started here full-time this month. Uh, but obviously... You know, uh, as the, the all the sort of financial stuff you've been talking about there, you know, that's reflected in, in the markets. Lots of volatility going on at the moment. Uh, the war in Ukraine, inflationary pressures in the US. So um, there's been probably some difficult conversations between a lot of IFAs nationally and their clients. <laughs> you know, it's always a, it's easy to have a, a review when, a, you know, when a client's investments are going up. But the markets obviously aren't doing so well at the moment. Um but ultimately, you know, within within the financial planning profession, you know, investments are are a long term, a long term thing, and you you expect the volatility within that. And you know, provided somebody's not needing access to their money right now, then the market is bound to bounce back uh, eventually, as it's proved over over the course of time. So you just have to ride ride the wave, as it were. Spoken, spoken like a, a, a real professional uh, <laughs> advisor there, covering all your, covering all your, all your bets. Uh, I'll tell you what then, mate, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned over the last sort of four weeks now you sort of more, more embedded in the business community? Uh, I don't know if there's one massive lesson. I think it's all just, it's just kind of learning every day and it's, it's just being, you know, knowing how to, when I was playing rugby, I knew how to utilise my time um efficiently and effectively and now it's kind of learning how to do that in a different environment in a totally different industry uh and kind of 
using the the same skill set and all the attributes that I kind of learned from my my professional rugby days and trying to translate them as as much as possible into into this new business. But I'm I'm lucky here at, at Gemini. You know, I've got two just two great directors here, Julian, who you've met, and Chris, um, and you know all the staff are, are, are very friendly. So it's uh, there's there's no pressure or expectation on me. It's it's just simply a case of you know being surrounded by those experienced guys and and then um, trying to build my own business as well. Yeah, it's just about you know you you've done it in sport. We do it again, mate. I'm sure I'm sure you'd be just as successful. Got I have no shadow of a doubt there. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks for joining us today. Um, okay, let's go over to you then, Jeff. Jeff, the events industry, we talked about it over the pandemic. What's it, what's it like now? We, it's, we... It, it's, it's coming back. I mean, it was decimated. And then we got all online-y and I invested loads of money in lots of wonderful cameras and stuff so we could go online and lights and all the bits. And then live, live just came straight back and, and nobody wants online now. So I mean, it's one of those great things. I mean, that's the, I think what all, all everyone else has said is it's the uncertainty of it because you can think, oh yeah, like Amazon, you know, oh, let's all invest this way. And everybody goes wrong. You should have invested that way. Um, what I'm finding, though, is uh, I've been doing this for years, as you know. Um, we've, we've got some great new material, exciting stuff. Selling in times of crisis is one of my themes. And everybody wants the old stuff. You know, they go, oh, that's good, Jeff. But could you do the crapping dog story? And could you do the shrub boys? And we love that story. And it's people who remembered me. And then they, they want to kind of relive it. But what? What on the business thing, as, as my guru put my guru hat on, is that, that there's a, a line that's been around ever since the Americans used to sell shoes door to door. You only cry once when you buy quality. And, and, I, and I think, and I think it's, I've said it in the article I wrote for you, which is I, I, I spent four hours holding on hold trying to get a refund from a company that had got my money. I, I was four hours on hold. Somebody answered. I said, oh, I've got to talk to you about this refund. That's not my department. They put me on hold for another two hours. Right. And I wasn't going to ring off because I wanted my money back. And, and I, and, but I, I, I think that during the boom time, the feeding frenzy, when people would bite at an empty hook, um, companies calculated that it's quite, it's quite apposite to abandon customer care. If you remember it right back in the, 90s and stuff people like british airways they, they built their whole business you, you paid a lot it was 400 quid to fly to aberdeen but they sort of mopped your brow with hot towels and gave you a sandwich and a cup of tea even on that flight that you hardly got off the ground for they were trying to give you sandwiches you know um and then they just sort of said well sod you and and i think they made this kind of calculation that the whingy people who who are unhappy can get stuffed and you only lose five or 10%, so they don't care. And, and they've almost calculated. I had a terrible time with Ford recently. They were just appalling. I mean, absolutely impossible to get something fixed. And I think that what I'm seeing now is that when times of hardship are like this, people actually buy better quality stuff. Um, there was, a, there was an old business guru called Faith Popcorn. And at the time of the last recession, she called it small indulgences. People who are finding money tight, finding money hard, they don't buy four bottles of Tesco whiskey. They'll buy a half bottle of a single malt. And then they'll go home and just treat themselves to half a glass a night. That, 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 so... Actually, if you have a quality product, strangely enough, in times of recession, you've got a better chance than if you've got a sort of bulky, cheap one. No, I'm not going to order a Domino's pizza every night, but I might save up for a month and have a really lovely meal served by friendly, kind people. So I think the old customer care thing is coming in back, strangely. I couldn't agree more. I always like to, I always like to say that the cream comes to the top. Oh, well, I say it's like a business management's like a cesspit and the big lumps float to the top. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I, I like to think that the cream comes to the top because, you know, 
Anyway, right, okay, well, we're, we're kind of running out of time, guys, so I'm going to quickly, quickly wrap up with what's caught your eye in this week's punchline. Sam, what's caught your eye in this week's punchline, please? Well, it, actually, it's a piece I, I contributed to as well, Mark. I mean, I, I live in the centre of Gloucester, and anybody that either lives or works in Gloucester will have discovered how, what a nightmare it's been this week because of the roadworks right in the city centre uh, between um, all the island, if you like, and Hempstead. It took me uh, two and a half hours for an hour-long journey on Tuesday to get to Bristol. I know, Mark, you've put a video on there about the, about the state, and it's going to be like this for six weeks. I mean, I can actually see that junction from where I'm sitting, and it looks quiet now, but that is deceptive. If you're in the Gloucester, if you're a business in the centre of Gloucester, this is going to really hurt you. So um, watch that video, see where it's involved, and, and good luck to anybody travelling around the middle of Gloucester for the next few weeks, sadly. I hate to say it, Sam, it's not just that, but as you go along Bristol Road, the, the traffic is being diverted. Uh, away and around to Bruton Way and it's clogging up there and not just that you've got the guys digging up the road for the cable and so around here the Tuffley there's lots and lots of different traffic lights it really is gridlock in the city I've never seen it so bad uh, and I, I will be having a little uh, well lobbying shall we say the, the, the city council councillors uh, uh, and the leader of the city council anyway right okay let's quickly go over to Paul what's caught your eye in this week's punchline well, as usual with me, it's got something to do with food or drink. I wish I could avoid that subject, but I like the Gloucestershire Food Awards and Steve Gardner Collins and and um, I can't remember the name of the guy, Jonathan, somebody who's the founder of it. But it's great to me. I love what's produced in Gloucestershire. I'm talking about the whole Shire now, and I, I love Gloucestershire. I only came here a couple of years, 19 years ago. I'm still here. But the food that's produced, and I'm talking about cheeses and meats, and there's, there's so much. I'd love to see a Gloucester produced only food fair. Um, not with burgers and things to eat, but things you can buy to take home and cook um, somewhere in, in, in Gloucester. But um, it's great to see that. And we've got so much to be proud of. And sometimes when we're down and everything, there's nothing better than some food and some company and some friendship uh, to, to make us all feel a lot better about this current current world and, uh, and, and where we are in, the, um, in the, 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 the political spectrum of the entire world. And I keep going back to the China-Russia axis and uh, the food takes some of that pain away. I totally agree. I watched the Wales and Italy game and I had to go and have something decent to eat afterwards. Okay. Um, <laughs> Char Charlie, what's caught your eye on this week's punchline, please, sir? Yeah, so back to sport. And um, <laughs> I thought it would, uh, as a Stroudy, um, I grew up in Stroud, I thought it'd only be fair to mention Forest Green getting their promotion for the first time to the third tier. Uh, so... Yeah, well done to those guys and wish them all the best for next season. And, and it's funny you should mention that, actually, because one of the things that we didn't do, because it was when, when that story came out, is that we were actually looking into the financial implications for the club as well, but hopefully we'll run that today. So what does it actually mean financially uh, to the club? Thanks so much for that, Charlie. OK, Jeff, what have you picked out in this week's punch? The, the missing link, the A417 bypassy thing. And again to go right back to Sam and every, everything else, is they don't kind of think it through. I live on Lake Hampton Hill, so I zip up Crickley Hill to my house. So it's just a quick way around, a shortcut. So I don't go down Sherdington Road. So when they open that, I won't be able to do that. Whilst they're building a thousand pupil school in Kidnappers Lane, where there's no footpaths, and they're putting a thousand pound, thousand house housing estate, and yet they're built, they're by part, they're put, they're put in a road that you can't actually drive around. And as you pointed out, the thing costs half a billion, half a billion pounds. And I, yesterday I was coming back from Gloucester and there's a massive motorbike crash at the, at the air balloon roundabout. And actually, there's a lot they could do to make that a lot safer and a lot smoother without spending half a billion quid and actually causing disruption to the entire road network of Gloucestershire. They don't kind of think it through, like Sam was saying about Gloucester. You, it's like one of those games where you keep turning corners and you've been cut off. I drive through Cheltenham, oh, hang on, they've dug, dug up Basil Road. No, I'll go, ah, ha, ha, I've sorted it. I'll go down the back of Montpellier. No, they've dug that up too. And, and you just wonder if they ever talk to each other about what they're digging up. This is exactly what's happening in Gloucester. The thing about that story, by the way, is, oh, Keir have got that contract. It's 400 and 460 million quid. Are they making it out of gold? It is, it is literally 130 million per mile. 
130 million quid per mile. I, I've just I just a, a quickie because because I know we're running out of time. I did a I, I did a, a a talk to a people who do the estimates for these projects, and and they they said oh well, the cost of the Channel Tunnel is 400 billion four four million five hundred and forty three pounds and sixteen pence. And I said, how do you do that? And they said, we always shove a 16 pence on the end because it looks like we know what we're doing. <laughs> it looks like, and I said, well, it always comes in at double the estimate anyway. And they said, oh, we know that. But it, it just, it instills confidence if you lob a few pence on the end. <laughs> right, thanks ever so much, guys, for today. I'd just like to thank our sponsor, uh, Hazel Woods. They've been absolutely fantastic. Guys, thank you ever so much for the panel. There isn't a show next week, so you'll have to just watch this one again. If you do like it, please like, share and subscribe. And we'll see you very soon. Thanks for watching Punchline Talks. Bye.